Hello everyone and welcome to our very first webinar of 2023. We are kicking it off today with the topic Certificate Lifecycle Management and the Integrations Ecosystem. My name is Leah Toms, EMEA Marketing Manager at Sigtigo, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Joining us as speakers are Mark Williams, Director of Product Management, and Tim Callan, Chief Experience Officer, both at Sigtigo. Mark and Tim will talk us through the IT security challenges we're seeing in the industry, why there's a drive for consolidation, where CA agnostic CLM comes in, why crypto agility matters, and finally, how to automate via integrations. If you have any questions during the presentation, please pop them into the chat function and we'll be able to answer them at the end. Mark, Tim, over to you. All right. Thank you, Leah, uh, and thank you all for joining. Um, my name is Mark Williams, and as Leah said, Tim and I are here today uh, to give you some important things to think about when implementing CLM automation in your ecosystem. Um, the kinds of challenges you face today are nothing like they were, say, five years ago. Uh -huh. Right now, you face a worldwide army of hackers with very sophisticated tools, both uh, technological and social tools. And in a post-COVID world, the remote workforce is the new norm. So now more than ever, managing even a small network ecosystem is super complex. And that complexity increases exponentially over time. Your network needs are gonna grow along with the needs of your business. And that means that your security stack is gonna grow with you. And you will end up with many different products and services from many different vendors for many, many different use cases. And it's your job to find a way to make them all work together. It's practically impossible, but just keeping your own staff trained on everything becomes a full-time challenge, right? At the same time, especially right now, you really have to work within the limits of the resources you have. So it's absolutely imperative that you put efficient processes in place to control costs and make the best use of your team. Yeah. Uh, Jim? And Mark, so actually, if I can, I, um, you, you said something I think provocative there. I wouldn't mind stepping back to it for just a second, if I may. You talked about facing an army of hackers. Uh, we talk to a lot of people um, you know, in, in IT leadership roles or security leadership roles, and one of the fallacies you sometimes see is uh, what they call the underdog fallacy, which is basically the idea that I think I'm not a target, right? I'm not a major bank, I'm not a global brand, therefore I'm not a target. I don't, you know, I'm not Fort Knox, I don't have the gold. And one of the things, if you look at the research, is that uh, really anybody's a target, <laughs> right? Every, every company has something that's of value. If nothing else, you could be subject to a ransomware attack. If nothing else, there's employee PII to be gotten. Uh, there's frequently customer PII to be gotten. Like there are, there, there's no business that has any kind of digital operation that isn't a target in some way. You know, and one of the things that you've seen is it's not just the, the large honeypots that are getting attacked, it's all of us. And that's why this complexity, like if you're not experiencing this complexity that Mark's talking about, you probably need to be, and that's probably in your future. So even if you don't feel like that's an issue today, as you start to you know, feel the, the potential for these attacks to occur, then it could occur down the road, right? And that could be a, a, a thing to be aware of. So I just thought it was worth uh, jumping back and mentioning that. Um, yeah, great point. Great point. So, so, um, so resources, sorry, we were talking about resources, right? So, you know, one of the things to think about here is there is an IT skills gap and there has been everybody who researches this. Every time an analyst firm researches this, they always find that IT leaders, CIOs, CISOs, managers, feel that they have trouble getting the, the correctly trained uh, uh, human resources they need to perform the IT operations they want to perform. And this skills gap gets exacerbated when you move into the area of specialty and security, right? We, we all have trouble keeping our staff going. 
And one of the one of the, the consequences of that fact is that it becomes extra important, not just because it's more efficient to have a computer do a thing than a human do a thing and therefore we can save money, but also because oftentimes we just can't hire the humans to do the things, period. They're just not available, they're working for someone else. And so this IT skills gap comes up again and again and again as a concept, right? To say, I don't have enough employees, how do I get the employees I need to do the critical things I do? And that's one of the big challenges we have, and we're gonna to return to that. We're gonna talk a lot about automation as a solution for this IT skills gap. There's another advantage there, which is one of the things that exacerbates our IT, IT skills gap, and Mark's put in his slide at the bottom, he said, in employee turnover. One of the advantages um, that you have if you solve this, this problem is that your employees, basically their career path, your employees do better things, they do harder things, they learn more skills, they do that special stuff that only humans can do, rather than that routine assembly line stuff that machines can do in their place. And what does that do? That gives you employees who are more engaged, they're happier, they're more likely to stay with you, they're more likely to grow, they're gonna be better, higher functioning employees who can do more things for you, and can ultimately add more value. So this resources problem, it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's about having the people you need and keeping them, but on the other hand, it's also about getting the most out of them. Now, if I can go ahead and move, keep going around the wheel here, uh, uh, compliance, right? Compliance is a big one. So it's one thing to be secure and make sure that your environment, your systems are secure, but oftentimes we need to be able to prove we're secure, right? This might be regulatory or industry requirements or governmental requirements, but it might also be SLAs for your customers. Or it might be what I have to report to my senior management or my board to prove that I'm compliant. Or um, uh, outside regulations like GDPR or CCPA that are hard requirements that you have to match or your customer company can be hit with big fines. And so these are all the kind of, of compliance needs you have. And it's gonna vary from industry to industry. You might be affected by HIPAA, you might be affected by HIVISMA, you might be affected by DFARS. It all kind of depends on what you're in or, or a bunch of other acronyms, right? And um, uh, you're gonna know what you have, but frequently part of that is not just, not just doing the security, but it's being able to know with 100% confidence that you've done things securely and being able to demonstrate that in some way to an auditor or another party. And so compliance is a real need. And then lastly, there's something we call crypto agility. And we're gonna deep dive on this a little later, but crypto agility is the idea that our cryptography is no longer static, right? If you go back in time, you know, RSA was invented in the late seventies and we're still using it today. So that's pretty crazy. That's more than 40 years with a single basic cryptographic strategy. And a lot of us grew up in that world where there are certain cryptographic algorithms, they are what we are, we use them, these are our primitives and they always work and everybody knows it. And that is not today's world anymore. Today we're in a world where computers are, are, are advancing faster than ever and there are actually new computer architectures that are gonna make a big difference on this, right? That's um, um, quantum computers are gonna fundamentally change how we have to deal with our encryption. We have uh, um, uh, just, New, new attacks and ideas coming up all the time. Just a month ago, there was a paper published by a bunch of academics and government researchers out of China that made the whole, the whole ecosystem question if we're gonna have to move away from RSA. And on that one, it turned out the answer was no, but maybe tomorrow there's gonna be another one and the answer is gonna be yes. We saw that with deprecation of SHA-1. We saw that with zero day vulnerabilities like Heartbleed and the, the, the Debian vulnerability. And there are things that come up where we have to be able to change our cryptography. It's not a static thing anymore. And this is really important for everybody to wrap their head around and everybody to have a strategy to deal with. Something might come out tomorrow and you might have to swap out lots of or all of your encryption. And every day that you don't do it, you might have a vulnerability. And these are things that occur. And so this idea of cryptographic agility, crypto agility, that we can take that and we can modify our cryptography on an as needed basis, currently and immediately to, to, to stay secure in a changing world is now part of our landscape. 
and it's one of the things we need to deal with. So we'll return to that. Yeah, it's it's absolutely not the same world anymore. I mean, it's not even the same world it was two years ago. So sure. uh, why don't we go to the next slide? These challenges are leading IT teams down um, the same path, and that that's consolidation. Gartner, they track this industry pretty closely, and, and they're saying that now 75% of organizations are consolidating, actively consolidating security vendors. But it turns out that it isn't all about cost reduction. Everyone is ending up with this the same problem where they, they have this Frankenstein's monster of, of a security stack. The real driver here is complexity. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Consolidation, so we all wanna reduce spend, right? But that's not the driver here that we're talking about. It's not, it's not the only driver. It's not the primary, primary driver. Complexity is risk. Consolidation is risk reduction. Consolidation is about eliminating all those uh, unnecessary redundancies in the security stack. Um, and consolidation is also gonna lead to efficiencies in say training staff and, and managing your vendors, right? It's about headache reduction and risk reduction. And ultimately it's about risk reduction, right, Tim? Yeah, absolutely, right. Um, and and these the again it's kind of the same thing the complexity of the it stack is just so much more than it was was re recently but also connected to that it's important to think about the interwoven nature of our system so you know if you go back in time not that far 10 years you tended to have a lot of siloed isolated functions and you'd have a system and it would be running a certain function, another system would be running a certain function, and if something went down, that function stopped working. But what we did, is, which is a smart thing to do, is we connected these things up to each other. We made it all more automated, we all made it all more robotic. And you're at the point now where you get these cascading failures. So a great example of this, actually probably the perfect example of this, was the O2 outage that occurred in, um, uh, about, I'm going to say three years ago, maybe four years ago, 2018, 2019, something in that ballpark. And 2018, I think it was. And what happened was most of, or everybody who used the O2 phone service, the SoftBank's phone service in Japan, and a bunch of other phone services around the world all lost data connectivity for almost a day. And there was this giant outage. And when we traced back the root causes, it turned out that there was a single expired certificate in a third party provider that was providing a service that helped manage these data services. And it was a cascading failure scenario. One certificate was expired without being renewed, that caused that system to fail. That caused the adjacent system to fail. That caused the system adjacent to that to fail, as what they depended on was no longer being provided. And it cascaded outward until it took down the entire data network for all of these major cellular providers. And at the time, that was a bit of an eye-opener for people, but that really is the new normal. And so one of the things that you have is you have everything's connected. And one of the benefits of consolidation is by reducing that connectivity, that complexity, you're also reducing your risk surface for these massive failures or for one thing to fail in place A, and it doesn't manifest itself until you're downstream in place B, and it's very difficult to, to diagnose the root cause because you're not even looking at the thing where the actual error occurred. And that kind of stuff all just gets reduced and minimized in likelihood and impact as you're consolidating and, and cutting down on the complexity of your systems. So yeah, I'll yeah. back to you. Right, so one last point on consolidation. Obviously you can't consolidate everything. You, you're going to have a still a complex stack of solutions that need to work together. But what you don't want is a cobbled together stack that represents um, your certificate management solution, right? And it, it's not just single pane of glass. You, you want an organically unified um, single pane of glass uh, platform to manage this process and automate this process from end to end, right? So let's go on to the next slide. We'll take a, yeah. 
a look at it from a different perspective. You know, this is this is the perspective of 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 things from the the point of view of the certificate management platform. You see us with our certificate manager in the center here. Um, so you're trying to manage certificates throughout your ecosystem. This is going to cover everything from certificate issuance, renewals, revocations, replacements, um, reporting, notifications, and remediation, all of that. Um, the platform will give you oversight over your full inventory of certificates. Um, again, on discovery, you, you need to know everything that's in your system. Um, you have to have control over every certificate in your ecosystem where it's used, when it expires, and you have to be certain that it meets your security posture, right? And certificates are not just for protecting domain names on web servers, right? As you look at the left, there are many, many different certificate types to cover tons of different use cases. Yeah. You know, TLS, SSL, obviously for web traffic, vital for authenticated internet connection, uh, communication, obviously. But there's also SMIME, um, for email signing and encryption. Very, very um, necessary, especially today um, with the remote workforce becoming so 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 much the norm. And then you have user and device certificates for things like authenticated access and other use cases. And you have certificates for signing documents. You have certificates for signing code, right? You have tons of different certificates and the certs can come from many different CA, certificate authorities within the same ecosystem. Now, Sectigo offers certificate authorities for both publicly trusted use cases and private, certific private certificates. Um, and you most certainly have certificates in your ecosystem from multiple CAs, from, from different vendors, uh, for many different reasons, right? You need all of those working together. And you, you need to have a management platform and a strategy with open support um to manage all of that and Sectigo's platform is open and truly agnostic right but the complexity doesn't end with the different types of certs right um those certificates have destinations that's where the real complexity kicks in um and probably why you're on the call today right um you're probably running services in a cloud you may be running the services in the cloud you may be using multiple clouds or a hybrid model um those clouds may come from different vendors. You you can't con necessarily control what your whole organization does, especially if you have a large enterprise. Um, people are putting together pieces of stuff that you have to support, and you may have yeah. clouds from multiple vendors. Uh, you might be running complex services in a very dynamic DevOps environment, and there, right right there, you have a whole another set. You, you, a dedicated certificate authority may be part of that environment. You might leverage a mix of key storage options, cloud-based key vaults and HSMs. And then of course, there's all of the various endpoints, right? Certs have to go places. They have to be on web servers, of course. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, and Mark, if I may jump in here, like these, all these things you're thro throwing, out, throwing out here, these decisions aren't in your control. Like the person who's right. in charge of PKI and certificates or even going all the way up to like the office of the CISO, these decisions are being made by others. So um, they're deciding which DevOps tools they want to use. They're deciding what those endpoint operating systems are. They're deciding, <laughs> you know, what, what, what the end devices are. They're deciding how they're managing their users and their devices. And uh, you've just got to be able to deal with what the organization needs and and the and the factors that are causing those decisions are very powerful and it's going to be hard for you to say I want a simple certificate management solution I want a simple PKI environment so no don't use Jetstack right <laughs> no you're not really going to be able to do that limit it to only Apache right you're not going to be able to do that in the real world you're going to have to be able to deal with the decisions that come down because of these very compelling other aspects behind behind how the decision is made. Yeah, I mean, it may be that the most you can hope for is to get your organization to agree on a security policy at least and make sure that everything conforms. But you can't get to that level of conformity if you're not managing everything from end to end. Right, and you're still going to have shadow IT, right? You're going to still have a development organization somewhere that decides to put this DevOps tool in place and doesn't ask, 
And yep. then suddenly it's running and it's helping the business and everybody else just gets to adjust. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So when you look at serving content to the public, um, you know, you, you have a web server that's, that's, um, that's using a certificate. Um, but more likely you're, you're going to have a group of load balancers supporting that content, serving that content. You may even have multiple groups of load balancers and you may have a cobbling together of load balancers from different platforms. It's, it's not uncommon at all. Um, on top of that, if you're serving content more globally, you know, across many different regions, you most certainly have a content delivery network partner, a CDN partner. You may even have more than one. You may have multiple clouds with multiple CDN solutions in place, right? But the point that you have to keep in mind is each one of those CDN server endpoints also needs to leverage a certificate. And you may put you know, a Sectigo publicly trusted cert on, you know, the, the domain where you're hosting it in, in your region, um, but you may not have that same certificate out on those other endpoints. And that's okay as long as the other endpoints are still meeting your security policies, right? So, you know, of course, there's all kinds of other types of devices, not just the publicly facing ones, but uh, you have devices in your ecosystem if it has an identity on your network it needs a certificate i mean mm -hmm. when was the last time you worried about a certificate on a firewall right but they need certificates too and they need to meet your your um security policies right and, and the point and is they will expire yeah they will expire <laughs> right and you may not know yeah. the, the point is you have to have control over all of these certificates or they will break things will break and it's sometimes very difficult to figure out where the break is and it causes downtime and it could in, and it will impact your business in some way sometimes in in major ways right so you need to be able to enforce your security policies you need to be able to maintain crypto agility across your entire ecosystem if you don't have that you have an intolerable level of risk so let's move to the next slide please Okay, integrations are necessary to achieve this level of automation and control, but how does it happen? Okay, so and the, the top left is, is, is uh, SSL, TLS. Um, this is generally achieved through ACME. ACME is now the, the default open standard for certificate management. Um, for every component in your ecosystem that supports ACME, you don't need a proprietary agent. You can use ACME, open standards. Of course, where ACME doesn't apply, um, you know, you, you will have agents that can achieve the same use cases. And in the bottom right, you have um, certs for users and devices, and it works the same way. Of course, the standards are, are different. There's SCEP and EST, but um, they, they, they function in the same way, and open standards are the way to go. That's what gives you the real flexibility uh, in trying to achieve the state. Um, you know, for key storage, you're leveraging uh, HSM. You can also leverage hosted vaults in cloud, such as uh, Azure or, or HashiCorp. And it, and, it, and it works the same way, essentially, with, with private CAs. These CAs can be hosted, they can be on-prem, and they can be hybrid, and they can come from multiple vendors, right? Um, I don't want to overstate it, but cer certificate discovery is a cr very critical part of this mix. And um, as as Tim said, we'll we'll go into that a little deeper when we talk about crypto agility. Uh, but we leverage a couple of options to maximize the discovery of of um, unmanaged certificates. You know, using yeah. agentless an agentless approach for external facing certificates and uh, agents for the internal ones. And if you don't want to belabor it, Mark, but maybe if it's okay, I will. Um, Certificate discovery is very important. If you're missing certificates, then all the rest of this stuff is incomplete and you still have risk, right? If the, if the certificates are out there in your environment, they're there for a reason. And uh, when and if they expire, or when they expire, they all expire, when they expire, uh, if they're not replaced with a suitable certificate, things stop working. And presumably, if those things don't matter in the first place, why are you running them? So if mm -hmm. we presume that those things have value, and we talk about the cascading failure that we talked about before, even something that feels to, seems to be relatively minor, 
can turn into something that is quite major. And these certificates can come from anywhere. They, there are lots of individuals and organizations that go and get these things. And there's this word, we call them rogue certificates or even rogue CAs, which are entire CAs that you didn't know about. And the rogue certificates are, are so frequently the problem. And, you know, we've, we've, we've dealt with lots of, you know, enterprises who have put certificate automation in place and have gone through a discovery exercise and been uh, shocked at the number and variety and origin of the certificates that they discovered that they simply didn't know existed. And maybe whoever came up with those certificates is going to replace them for you and renew them and keep the system running if you're lucky. But that person gets a new job, that person moves on, that person gets a different role inside the organization, that person gets a little distracted, and one day you have a very bad day. And frequently those rogue certificates aren't even coming from your employees. It's a contractor, it's an agency, it's a custom development house, and they deliver their thing and it's working fine and they get their money and they go off to their next project with their next client. And then 365 days later, there's a problem and everybody's running around with their hair on fire. And this happens over and over and over again. And so discovery is very important, right? You wanna find those things, bring them into the system, know what they are, get visibility, put automation in place, get them under management, make sure they're compliant, make sure they match with the standards and the requirements that you want, make sure that the cryptography is current and up to snuff and be able to change it if it isn't. And all of that starts with discovery. That's right. Yeah. What you don't know will hurt you for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next slide. Let's give a little bit of a time to private CAs. Um, while we've had support for Microsoft CA for, for quite a while, um, we just announced our support for Google Cloud and AWS, which means that we can um, manage those certs in those environments. So um, you don't have to use Sectigo certs in those environments. And um, you know, not just, you know, we've already um, been capable of issuing Sectigo certs, private and, and, and public, into these environments. But now if, for whatever reason, you want to use the house cert that comes with it, um, we will manage that just the same. Um, it, it's What's important is that you manage them centrally um, so that you can apply all of your company security policies way more effectively. And this is this is what we mean by uh, CA agnostic. And let's let's move to the next slide. We'll cover that really quickly. Um, CA agnostic. And this comes back to the value of consolidation and the reduction of complexity. It's all about dealing with the Frankenstack. Just like having uh, similar endpoints from different vendors, you're going to have similar CAs from different vendors, and that's okay. You can still make the best use of your resources while enforcing your security policies, right? The CA is just really another component in the chain. You want a platform that's truly open and truly agnostic, right? And that's gonna bring us to crypto agility. Let's go to the next slide and I'll give it to you, Tim. Yeah, so we, 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 we kind of touched on this, we defined it, right? So crypto agility, our cryptography changes and we have to be able to stay current um, and, and, and that's critical. Without that, we can fail and we can fail big or we can be breached and we can be breached big. So that's where this concept of crypto agility comes up. What we mean by crypto agility is that you have to be able to respond very quickly in an agile way to required changes in the cryptographic environment. And when once upon a time that was very slow, it is increasingly fast and there's every reason to believe that it will continue to become increasingly faster over time. One of the important things to rem remember is that most of our cryptography is governed by our certificates. So while you don't need certificates for encryption, while you don't need certificates for PKI or key pairs, most of the time that's how it's done. And the reason for that is that certificates are fundamentally better. They're, they include metadata, they include lifecycle management capabilities, they include automatic, you know, guaranteed expiration dates, right, term, and all of those things are not built into just a fundamental cryptographic algorithm. And in the absence of those additional enveloping certificate capabilities, 
your cryptography is missing some very important parts that it needs. So in the real world, it's almost always a certificate. And so the, a, a necessary component of achieving crypto agility is achieving what we call certificate agility. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Certificate agility is the ability to replace, to know what they are and replace any and all certificates in your environment at any time. So you could wake up tomorrow and there could be one specific certificate that needs to be replaced right now. And you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to pinpoint the right one and get it done. Or you might wake up tomorrow and it turns out there's a whole tranche of certificates. All of my TLS certificates need to be replaced. Or all of something else needs to be replaced. So you need to be able to error-free immediately replace any and all of your certificates up to and including all of them. You need to be able to pick the specific certificates that need to be, re able to be replaced and get those right every time. And then you need to be able to verify that you have done so, not only to prove it to your own satisfaction, but oftentimes to prove it to other people. And in the absence of this, your organization does not have true certificate agility. Many organizations don't, it's very common. But if you don't, it's a risk, right? It's one of the problems that we can face is something comes up, these things happen, and we're incapable of dealing with it, and we have outages, and we have breaches, and we have SLA failures, and we have compliance failures. And the root cause is lack of certificate agility. So one of the things that we really, really push and we really have people to think about is, do I have an agile certificate environment and what do I get to do, do to get there? So what do you need to do? Next slide, please. So first of all, part of it is just wrapping your head around this idea, getting educated on the concept that you need to be able to do that and thinking through a plan of how you're gonna get there. And we're starting with this conversation right now, right? So that's a good place to start. You really go away and say, I need to be able to do this. This certificate agility and this crypto agility is, is necessary for me. Uh, and then the pragmatic steps that come after that. First thing is you gotta inventory your PKI. You gotta know what you have, and where it is. And I know I already said this three times and I apologize, but it's extremely important. You gotta know what you have and where it is. So that's not only the public certs that you get from people like Sictigo, but it's also your own private CAs. And the certificates you use with those, those need to be agile too. Those can have vulnerabilities too. Those can fail too. And we talked about rogue certificates already. You got to watch those. You got to find those. Discover them and bring them in under your management. The other thing to remember is this inventory isn't a one-time activity or a sit down and do it once a year activity. Certificates are always changing. They're expiring. New ones are being created. New services are being stood up. New, new servers and domains are being created. New machines are being provisioned. And that means that the certificates you have are changing in real time. So what you really need to go for is real-time visibility, where you always know what you have and it's current as of today. And that's the only way that you're really going to be able to deal with cryptographic challenges that might come up. Now, some of these, and again, we've talked about this too, certificate expirations, they're built into the system, they belong there. But what it means is every certificate is a little ticking time bomb. So your whole environment is full of these time bombs and at any given moment, any one of them might blow up and ruin your day. So what you need to do is you need to, first of all, take action on that. So automatic expiration actions are critical. And on the one hand, this could just could be notifications. Let me know, let me know it's coming. Scream at me if it's not handled with, you know, in a certain time frame. The closer we get to the deadline, scream louder, right? And that's one of the things that, that absolutely matters. But what's even better is if you can automate that. If you can just get the new certificate, renew it, obtain it, provision it, install it, and all of that happens automatically. And to the degree you can do that, that's really the best solution. And you just have computers doing this, working for you all day, every day, solving your problems while you sleep. And that's what a lot of people that we talk to are trying to get to. That's sort of their holy grail. Um, and there's good reason for that, right? It just makes, makes everything more reliable. It cuts down on that human capital drain that we talked about before. Um, it keeps your very expensive human resources doing the important things that only humans can do. And it lets software do the things that software can do for us. So that's, you know, that's a big part of what we're looking at. Um, and if you can do all of that, and then also not only for renewal, 
but automatic provision and deployment of the new certificates as well. Like while we're at it, once we have things getting getting renewed and installed, when I need a new cert, wouldn't it be nice if I could have that automatically installed for me while I'm at it? Once again, it's saving time. Once again, it's protecting humans from the drudge work that's gonna you know, make them loathe their jobs. And it is, uh, it's much more reliable, right? You can rely on the fact that it's done the same way every time. And you can confirm once that that's being done accurately and correctly, and have a high degree of confidence that the next one and the one after that also will be done accurately and correctly. And then you can see the result, right? If, again, if you've got visibility, you'll know that it is. You can look at it. You can see, see it right there in your report, or right there in your dashboard, or right there in your BI tool. And so all of that together is really your, your very high-level roadmap for how to get to crypto agility. Now, we could drill down you know, in detail on each of these, and we've had other webinars in the past that have, and we'll probably have some in the future that will, and you should join us for those. But that's probably enough for this conversation. But you know, this is your main roadmap. This is what you're trying to do to have a truly crypto agile environment. Back to you, Mark. Yep, Tim, I, I would like to just add one point drilling down on the very first item you listed and educating yourself. I, I just want to remind you, don't forget to educate your organization too. That's part sure. of that process. You sure. know, you need to get your organization to understand what the risks really are to the business and agree on a security posture and agree to stick to it. Uh, your your job is gonna be a lot easier if you have you know that universal agreement on what you're trying to achieve. I think that's a great point, Mark. I agree completely. All right, let's uh, let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so here's here's one more look at at how all the pieces fit together. Now I'm not gonna drag you through all of this, but let me just point out a few things. And as we mentioned. So Sectigo is very big on open standards. And the reason is that that gives you a lot of flexibility and ensures that all of these different components play well together in your ecosystem. So you've got ACME, EST, and SCEP, uh, and those, those areas in the, in the top left. Um, those are the standards that will enable PKI-based security use cases through most of your ecosystem. We have proprietary agents, of course, that can be used when, when necessary, when you can't use an open standard. And if you're, uh, if you're into an adventure, you can write your own custom implementations because we have a RESTful API. Um, so all of that is available, all of that flexibility. You need the system that you're, that you're using to manage all of this to be open and flexible, right, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. Right. On a side note, <clears throat> you don't, have to rely on all of those email notifications to track alerts as we hinted you you can plug the uh you can plug your system into the notifications and remediation workflows that that you use internally such as teams and and slack um, that makes delegation and tracking so much more efficient um, and we have more coming in that you know underneath that category on the roadmap which i'd be happy to share with you one-on-one -on -one. Um, and uh, on that note, let's go to the next slide, how to get more information. Um, I would love to speak with anyone um, directly, and this is my email address, please reach out to me. I would absolutely love to hear what your challenges are and get your thoughts on the direction that Sectigo is heading. Um, if you have a, a Sectigo account manager, they can also be a great resource. And if you don't have a Sectigo account manager, um, you can reach out to me and I will connect you with the right person. And if you're interested in some real PKI inside baseball, you have to check out Tim's podcast. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, uh, one of my co, one of my associates here, Jason Soroko and I run uh, Root Causes, a PKI and security podcast. Uh, we focus specifically on the kinds of things we talked about today. PKI, digital certificates, encryptions, uh, digital identity, online trust models, uh, uh, and related blockchain and related factors like that. We have more than 270 episodes published. We're publishing new episodes every day. We deep dive on a lot of these topics and we follow breaking news and we follow industry trends over time. We'd love to have you join us. If you search for Root Causes PKI, you'll find us and we're everywhere you listen to podcasts. Perfect. All right, let's move on to the questions. 
Leo. Yeah, and thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, thanks, Tim, for the insights. Um, we've got a couple of questions through. The first one is, do you integrate with ServiceNow? That is a great question, and um, we probably should have covered that. The uh, ServiceNow integration that we have is actually um, one of our better ones. It's a We have a complete app um, that's in two parts on the ServiceNow store. Um, we have the connector app, which enables all of those workflows in ServiceNow. For, for those of you who don't know what ServiceNow is, um, you probably will at some point soon. They, they are a wildly successful IT um, services management solution, and they enable workflows for the IT professionals. And um, what we enable with our app is the, all of the administration of certificate management that so you can have it done within ServiceNow. So people can submit um, requests to have certificates issued or renewed and all of the related um, administrative functions of uh, certificate management. We also have a component that goes with that called the spoke, the certificate management spoke, which allows, I think they call it the form editor. Uh, but that allows you to create custom workflows and you can do that for certificate management. So. Great, thank you. Um, the next question I should have probably mentioned at the beginning. Yes, we are going to share the presentation um, at the end, um, probably tomorrow. Um, the next question we had in, can these certificates be applied to all productions? To all productions. I, I, I'm. I'm not sure I quite understand the, the verbiage there, but yes, like at the end of the day, at a high level, if you have a digital function, you have certificates. <laughs> if you have a digital function and you don't have certificates, you have vulnerability and risk. And most operating systems and most software that you buy and most hardware that you, you, you get actually just won't function correctly if you're not applying certificates to them. Uh, but even if they will, you really don't want to be so you know this is this is the thing that you know we all have to realize is that you know if there's one place in our system where there's a hole that oftentimes is the beginning of what is a much bigger problem so when you hear about a lot of these you know big breaches what happens is someone finds a way in like the printer spool for whatever reason is a big one they'll get in through the printer spool and once they're in, they move laterally inside the network and they attack things that really matter. Because you might say, well, who cares about my print jobs, right? You make my printer stop working. What have you really done to me, right? You see the contents of my Word documents as, as graphic files. Who cares, right? Yeah, fine, whatever. But what happens is that opens up access into the system and you move around and these guys move around and they do what's called living off the land. Once they're in, they, they use the access they have to find the next attack and the next place and they move and move and move and move until they get to the juicy stuff, right? And so you have to think that everything in your connected digital environment is a potential entry point. Yeah, now, and all of those entry points need to be locked down and that's done in part not entirely, but in part through digital identity and digital certificates. Yeah, it's possible that that question was referring to a production environment for um, devices in an IoT type of context. And we do have a complete solution as part of the platform for IoT. Um, that would be, uh, that's a deep topic. Um, and we yes. have a ton on that, but absolutely the answer to that is yes. Okay, great. Great. Um, the next question is, we have been hearing that there's going to be a reduction in certificate terms from one year to 90 days. Can you speak to that a bit? So we're talking at this point about public certificates. Obviously, your private certificates can have whatever term you choose because you're the CA and you get to choose, right? In the world of public certs, it doesn't work that way. There are rules and everybody's expected to follow those rules. That's the nature of public certificates. And at the moment for TLS certificates, which I think is what this refers to, it is a one year term. It's actually 13 months, right? 398 days. And that's the maximum term that a certificate can have. As time moves on, that is probably going to go down. It's gone down in the last few years. Just a few years ago, it was three years, 
like three, four years ago, it was three years. Then it was down to two, then it was down to one. It's been one year since, uh, for a while now, is it going to 90 days? I think in the long run, that is pretty much a guarantee. However, that certainly isn't happening this year. Uh, but I think that's coming in the next few years. So it's something to watch for, for sure. There's not an imminent deadline that's approaching that anyone's aware of. Uh, usually these things, we get a lot of lead time, like the, the, the cab form or the browsers aren't going to spring this on us. They're going to give everybody a chance to adjust. So you won't see that in 2023. Will we see that in 2024? It's a possibility, um, but that's not guaranteed. Will we see it by 2025? I'd be surprised if we didn't. So not here today is coming. The exact timing on that is still to be determined. Um, is the Acme connector in SEM compatible with widely used Acme clients like Certbot? That is a yes. Um, if you're trying to do certificate automation, there is a caveat though. Um, the Acme implementation on the other end of it, um, in order to, to facilitate that automation, does have to support what's called external account binding, but that's becoming uh, more and more commonly supported. You, you can be Acme, you can support Acme without supporting that piece of it. Um, but in order to achieve full automation, you do need to have the external account binding support. We support it um, all the way. So Acme is our preferred um, standard uh, for, for management of certs. Great. Um, another one. Have you seen a push from developers to integrate Acme, other cert automation methods into their software natively? Well, we're certainly part of the, you know, the we're one of the voices trying to push in that direction. We are. Uh, we did. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I would hope so. I mean, Acme really has taken on a lot of power as a broadly supported standard. And if you look at the number of sites that support it and, you know, the fact that, you know, CA support for it is, is vast. Um, it gives it a lot of power to become basically a de facto standard. And uh, there are limits on what Acme is, but there are opportunities to make it better. And we've participated in that. We've been part of expanding Acme so that it does more and offers more capabilities. And I think there's more of that potential in the future. And as, as you know, the industry works on that, there's every reason why Acme could be a, a great universal language for many kind of certificate use cases, and that's really good for everybody. Um, I, we have seen support for Acme growing over time. I expect it to continue to grow over time. If you want to look at any individual, you know, piece of software or hardware or service and ask, is this supporting Acme? That'll be an individual uh, uh, decision. But Acme support is broad, and Acme support is broad for good reasons, and uh, I think we're going to see that trend continuing. Yeah, and we, we are big evangelists in the space. I mean, we even funded the development of Acme at, in Apache for to support the uh, the automation. This That's the external account binding um, functionality that I mentioned. I mean, we're willing even to fund it if needed, um, and uh, but we're really heavily involved in evangelizing. Right. Um, someone else is asking, can we talk some more on ISO PKI standards? Yeah, so your ISO PKI standards, again, that's a deep dive kind of question. So for everybody, ISO, of course, is one of the very common um, auditing uh, uh, standards that will go through so that you can demonstrate that your security and your processes and your you know, disaster recovery and things along those lines are uh, suitable so that outside parties who care can look at your ISO reports, so you can look at your ISO audit reports and understand, you know, am I meeting the, the, the grade for this or am I not? Um, in terms of PKI, one of the things to understand about ISO is a lot of what you're doing in ISO is up to the, the scope of how you define. So what ISO is really here to do is to show what you're doing. And if what you're doing is PKI is pell-mell, it's Lord of the Flies, nobody has any idea about what's going on in anything, then your ISO report will reflect that. And then the outsider can decide, is that okay, right? 
or if your ISO report, or if you're doing something that's much more rigorous, then your ISO report will reflect that. Um, and what it's really about is how does that fit in with the requirements that third party has, uh, depending on what their level of uh, 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 security, you know, risk tolerance is, they may feel that's okay, they may feel it's not okay. Um, and, and, you know, that's really something for each of us to think about individually. What I would say is if you are happy with where you sit from a PKI perspective, why would you not have your ISO report say that? I would say if you're looking at ISO reports because you're trying to understand if a vendor is right for you, you may or may not see information on that. You may or may not see something that's talking to you about how they do PKI and what the specifics of it are. And I don't, you know, I don't have any numbers on this, but I think oftentimes it's you won't see. And under those circumstances, you're probably going to just have to ask directly and get the answers that you need to make sure that you're comfortable with what that vendor is doing. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, is in common Sectigo Private CA available? In common, are, are we talking about the 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 folks that serve okay. the education field? Yes. Yeah, so in yes, correct. So in common is a partner of Sectigo's, and in common serves a lot of higher education um, uh, uh, customers and clients. And so is in common private CA available? I'm not sure what we mean by available. We may mean available like does it integrate? Is it one of the um, CA sources that we can use inside of our platform? If that's the question, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what's being asked. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next one. What's and the if difference? that's a question about what in common's offering, I don't want to speak for in common. I think it would be better to ask them. Um, but but there's there's the answer to that. So go on. Brilliant, thanks. Um, what is the difference between SCEP and EST? Ah, that's a good one. Um, SCEP and EST are, the intention is to accomplish the, the same thing. It's just that um, one is much newer than the other. So what, what those two standards are for is to enable, say, a device to request um, the certificate from the CA. Um, and SCEP is an older standard. It's not necessarily all the best practices, modern best practices, but it's a good solid spec. EST is the is more of the evolution of that. Um, we support both, but SCEP is widely, widely used still. And so that's why it's still so very common, even though one might one might say that EST is a um, is maybe a superior spec. Okay, um, you guys listed a lot of different certificate types. Do I need to use all of them to care about this? You need to you see, it's, it comes down to what you have in your ecosystem. If, if anything in your ecosystem, from human to machine and everything in between, if it has an identity in your ecosystem, you should have a cert associated with it. You don't have to use every cert type that's listed. Um, it's really going to come down to your security posture and your policies, right, Tim? Absolutely, right. I mean, the, the, what we showed was a very broad list of certificate types. You may not be doing all of those, and that's okay, right? Uh, the key is whatever ones you are using, we need to make sure that you're able to support those in an automated, integrated, single pane of glass kind of fashion. That's what's really most important. And then you're going to decide what your use cases are and what your certificate types are. There's some you're always going to have, right? You're all, everybody has TLS certificates, and we probably pretty much all have device certificates and things like that. But then some of these other things are more specific, and you may not, and that's fine, right? But if you do have them, or if you grow into them in the future, right? Or if it expands, and now you're using these things in the future, then we need to make sure that they can fit into your automated strategy that you have. Yep. Right. Um, what kind of developments are coming to the industry that are going to drive the need for crypto agility? Right. Well, so we talked about one of them already, which was certain shortening certificate lifespans. 
and certificate lifespans are shortening and they will continue to shorten and that is just how it is and that for sure is making <clears throat> meaning that we all have to be able to adjust with these things much more quickly uh, another big one is quantum computers so quantum and I, I referenced this very briefly early on but quantum computers are a real thing and they're coming it's no longer a matter of if it's a matter of when and as quantum computers get more and more powerful one of the consequences of that is that our existing RSA and ECC algorithms are not going to be reliable. They will be broken by quantum computers effectively. And so the world right now, uh, NIST, uh, the Na National Institute of Standards and, and um, Technologies, and uh, a bunch of uh, large community of industry and academic participants and other governments are all basically rolling out what we call post-quantum cryptography. And post-quantum cryptography is new cryptographic primitives that will not be defeated by quantum computers on anything like the trajectory they're on today. And we're going to have to implement these things because quantum computers are going to break all of our RSA. And so that's coming. And that's coming not too far in the future. And it's something that we're going to have to deal with. So those are a couple great examples. And of course, like I said, there could be a zero-day vulnerability tomorrow that's equivalent to heart bleed, and all of a sudden we're all going to change our crypto. Or there could be a breakthrough like the one that came through a month ago, where we thought maybe RSA was was defeated, and maybe next time it will be. And we're all going to have to go and change our crypto. So this is just the world we live in. So it's predictable things like shortening certificate lifespans and quantum computers, and then it's those unknown gotchas, and they're all a possibility. Great. Um, I think we've got through most questions here. I'm conscious of time. I think we're going to stop here. Um, the questions where we owe you an answer, we'll get back to you. Uh, thanks for your time. If you've got any more questions, then do get in touch with the Sectigo team, uh, team or with Mark directly. Um, we've got plenty more webinars coming up throughout the year, so keep an eye on our website and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. everyone.